Good evening. Um, thank you for uh, all for being here tonight with us. Uh, my name is Mayumi Ishikawa, the uh, counselor for Communi communication and public, uh, cultural affairs at the Embassy of Japan. Tonight's event uh, is the second in the series of bonsai events that are happening this year between um, the JICC and the uh, Nash Bonsai Museum here in Washington, D.C. Um, I would like to ask you, uh, those people who, who have been to our first bonsai event, happened in June, July, sorry. Okay, we have uh, several people. And how many of you have a, a keep the a bonsai plant at your house? Oh, we have several as well. Um, as far as I'm concerned, uh, whenever I see a beautiful bonsai at a park or museum, I always, you know, want to have one for myself. But I only have kept a, a boat, a small plant of cactus because <laughs> I don't know. I mean, I lack all the, you know, knowledge and effort. But tonight's um, talk uh, by Mr. Jones may uh, change my mind or may change your mind as well. Well, tonight's guest, uh, Mr. Adam Jones, is the first Western-born bonsai professional to operate a garden in Japan. After training for five years at the prestigious Mansei Inn in Omiya Bonsai Village, Mr. Jones' garden, which he opened just last year, is called Tree House Bonsai, just 30 minutes away from Narita International Airport and is located in Amimachi in Ibaraki Prefecture. His goal at the Tree House Bonsai is to bridge Japan, <coughs> sorry, bridge Japan and West, both through his um, bonsai work and his efforts at education. He wishes to help Westerners overcome the linguistic and cultural barriers to bonsai not only Westerners, I guess, uh, including Japanese as well. The history of bonsai in the DMV area goes back at least as far as 1975, when Japan gifted 53 bonsai to the National Arboretum for the 1976 American Bicentennial. Now, almost 45 years later, the Omiya Bonsai Museum and the National Bonsai Museum at the National Arboretum have joined together as sister museums. This area's climate is similar to Japan's, so plants like cherry blossom, tree, uh, cherry blossom trees and bonsai trees are <clears throat> able to thrive here. But these gifts from Japan are still so beautiful that I also think uh, there must have been immeasurable um, efforts by American caretakers uh, to preserve them. I hope that tonight's event will give you ex give any experts and enthusiasts of bonsai in attendance a further inspiration. And those who are not familiar with bonsai, including myself, encouragement to visit um, the bonsai museum at the National Algorithm for further enjoyment. In fact, like uh, Atsushi said in the beginning, uh, Mr. Jones will be presenting again there um, this weekend, this coming Sunday, um, from 1 to 3 p.m. Uh, so without further ado, please welcome tonight's guest, special guest, Mr. Adam Jones. hear me? Anyway, uh, thank you all for coming. Uh, my name is, as was already mentioned, my name is Adam Jones. Uh, originally I'm from Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania. Just a short trip up a little north of the area. Um, but I've been living in Japan since 2011. So tonight I'll give you a brief history of what Japanese bonsai is, sort of. Uh, and then we'll get into uh, a demonstration and I'll, I'll take some raw stock and uh, start it on its way to becoming a, a bonsai. 
So to start with, here we have a foreigner's view of Japanese bonsai. So a brief introduction, I studied the fine arts, drawing and painting, uh, at a place called Alfred University in upstate New York. Anyone ever hear of Alfred University? Really? Really? <laughs> wow. <laughs> All right. Uh, so yeah, so I studied uh, and got this degree in the fine arts and secondary education. And then in 2011, I decided that despite of earthquakes and tsunamis and nuclear disaster, I would move to Japan and study small trees. So I went to Omiya and at a place called Mansein, I apprenticed there for five years. And um, that's like the typical amount of time, the standard amount of time to be an apprentice at a Japanese bonsai garden is five years. Some people do for longer and others for shorter, but if you want to be a professional in Japan, five is the minimum. So uh, part of this art that I was studying was this relationship between uh, man and nature. And so if you look at you know, the world that we live in these days, we're surrounded by concrete and tall buildings and things, and maybe we're slightly separated from the natural world. So I thought if we could, pursue, if I could pursue bonsai, maybe I could kind of bridge that gap as well between what it is to be a human living in these concrete jungles uh, separated from nature. So, here we go. Uh, bonsai, right? When we take care of bonsai, we make this bonsai, this requires some fundamental horticultural knowledge and some bonsai specific techniques. But then when we view the bonsai, this requires an art uh, artistic sense and the knowledge of the cultural history or context of that work. Right. So when we think about bonsai, obviously it's man-made, so there's some relationship between human and the plant that's going on there. Um, so that might lead you to the question, what in fact is bonsai? So uh, why don't we all just relax and we can think about that, like Zen style, what is bonsai? It's a tree and a forest and whatnot. Um, the idea here is that the kanji bonsai, right, is uh, this one here, bonsai. So this first kanji here means pot, and the second means plant, or planting. So technically speaking, if we look just at that bonsai definition, it would be any plant that's planted in a pot would be bonsai, right? Uh, it, going a little deeper than that, it's this idea of you can have like a tree in a pot, or you could also maybe have some grass in a pot too. So. That's bonsai, right? If you take a tree and put it in a pot, it's a bonsai. Maybe even including a cactus, that would be okay too. Uh, so really when you get into bonsai, it's the, the techniques that we're using to cultivate the tree that make it bonsai, rather than the fact that it's just a tree in a pot. That doesn't exactly make it bonsai. So uh, the conifers, if we start to talk about conifers of, inside of bonsai, well, pines, and any other kind of conifers, right? They're evergreens. So the pines keep their green leaves all year long, and this allows us to enjoy this green foliage even in the depths of winter, you know, when it's cold and gray. And we have this little bit of green in our life, and that it's relaxing, it's refreshing, it's nice. So here we have, uh, you see this like white area of the trunk? This is dead wood, and it's referred to as gin. And then next to that is this live vein. So in some species of evergreen, the relationship and interplay of the living vein and the dead wood uh, invokes, you know, it starts to tell the story of the life of this tree, the hardship that it's gone through, the struggles of uh, living on a mountain or, or whatnot. So here, if we talk about deciduous trees, well, in the spring, oh, sorry. Button. In the spring, we've got uh, rich foliage, right? Lots of leaves, and that's nice to look at too. Green leaves, red leaves are pretty, so that's good. And as the trees begin to enter into their winter dormancy, all these trees fall. And then at the beginning, while you got what people were entering, we had that little brief video of that guy on the mountain build, planting the, the maples. Same deal, right? We can enjoy our bonsai for the quality of their red colorful leaves in the fall. And in the winter time, after all those leaves fall off, well that's when we get to enjoy 
the, uh, the bones of the trees, as it were. So if we look back at this picture, it's hard to tell what the quality of that tree actually is because you can't really see any of the branches. They're covered with big leaves. But in the wintertime, after all those leaves fall off, then that's when we can start to really see the, the, the quality of the ramification inside of the bonsai. So specifically, when you're talking about bonsai display, it's seasonal displays, but the high, high quality bonsai displays, you typically would see those in the wintertime so that you can enjoy the green of the evergreens. Yeah, but then at the same time, you can actually see the quality of the ramification inside of your deciduous species. So, if we move on to the shapes inside of bonsai, these shapes are, there's like a set of kind of standard shapes that have evolved with the bonsai culture over the years, over the centuries. And this is kind of the, the general rundown of what those shapes are. You could, in fact, make a bonsai any shape you wanted to, but if we think about the cultural aspects of bonsai, um, in Japan anyway, and therefore, in Japan and therefore, as the Japanese qualities of bonsai have been exported to the world, these kind of standard shapes have been, you know, set. Let's say, uh, right. So. The beginning of bonsai. This happened a very long, long time ago, in a, a long time ago, in China. Uh, there, uh, it goes there's this like Taoist teacher who possessed the skills to create a whole world inside of a single pot. Right. This is the first mention of any kind of skills that would be required to make bonsai. And then later on, in the 970, uh, the first kind of mention of Japanese bonsai happened. So this quote here, a tree left to grow on its own in nature is rough and unclean. However, with the loving intention and a skilled grower, a tree can truly become beautiful and capable of impressing powerful feelings on one's heart. So this is the first mention of Jap in Japanese of active cultivation of potted trees. And this is a very interesting point because if you have, uh, this is like, a, it's so Japanese, right? If, if you can take something and, and make it, through the, the process of working on it, make it stronger and more of the essence of that thing, then that thing would be of itself, right? So take a carrot and make it taste more like a carrot than any carrot you've ever eaten before, right? This is Japanese cooking. So Japanese bonsai, take a tree and make it look more like a tree than any tree you've ever seen before. That's our challenge. So, uh, <laughs> yeah, how do you do that, right? How do you do that? That's uh, the trick. Uh, one way is, right, a long, long time ago, we didn't really have a lot of tools, and it's just, you know, clipping things and cutting things with scissors. And then we, in the beginning of the 19th century, uh, wire was introduced, the process, the technique of using wire to shape the trees. This was first introduced early in the 19th century. And uh, from then, oh, I guess that'd be the 20th century, uh, <laughs> 1910. So copper wire was really expensive, and so it was only this, this technique was only used for the, the really fancy, really high-end trees at that point. But as technology advances, so does wire. Um, and nowadays, it's it's used kind of primarily. This is like a blanket approach: put wire on trees, and that can help you shape them. So if we only look at pruning things, typically most styling was done using scissors. This is a before pruning and an after pruning of the same tree. We can see here at the beforehand, it's quite bushy and um, kept looking, in need of a haircut. And then afterwards, how clean and pretty does it look? And so this is just using scissors. Uh, here we go. Here's an example of a top quality tree from 40 years ago. And you can see there's, so again, this is just like scissor work. It's all right. And then here's some junipers from that same time period. And these junipers, some problems that they have. So you can see that this is not so clean, right? It's kind of looks a little unkept. And then here in this one, the design of this tree maybe does not balance so well between the, the trunk and the foliage mass. So 40 years ago, this is what's happening. Same deal with the pine trees. 
some unkept foliage pads and some unbalanced movement in this tree. So if we take these, and now let's compare them to what currently is top quality trees. Very beautiful, right? The foliage pads are very clean. The lines around the top are very clean. The aesthetics, the balance of this tree, as the, the trunk moves this way, but it's offset by the weight of the visual mass of these branches here. So recently, right, over the last, let's say, 50 years, the aesthetic approach of bonsai has really taken leaps and bounds. And uh, here again, we have this, this 40 years ago versus now, the ramification and the quality of that tree. It's, of course, not the same tree, but the quality of the difference between years ago and now is quite obvious between these two trees. And I'll, this, is, this is all happening in Japan, but the, the approach, the consideration has gone up in level. So uh, traditionally in bonsai there are very, have been very strict rules, but recently these rules have started to be pushed in the aesthetics, the artistic approach to bonsai is much stronger now than it was before. This gentleman right here is named Masiko Kumara. He's very, very famous for making fantastic bonsai trees. He's uh, 76 ish years old. Nice guy. So, um, with that, that's my little intro to bonsai. Uh, I'm going to start working on a tree behind me here for the remaining hour or so that we have left. And as I'm working, please feel free to ask questions about what I'm doing and then also any other questions you might have. That's no problem. I think there's some. Um, microphone somewhere around there, or maybe if you just have a really loud voice. Yes, you have a question already. Yeah, the big fin of deadwood. Yeah. Um, it's probably the, the on that particular one. It, the the tree itself has been growing, and and as it grows, the live vein recedes, and the deadwood keeps growing. So most of the time, if you see a, a tree that has deadwood features, they're they're uh, an actual part of the tree, rather than like we take a piece of deadwood and graft something onto it. Not so much. Um, but yeah, the the relationship. So this tree that we're working on right now is a uh, procumbens juniper, and if can't see, but if you were really close to it, you'll see that naturally in junipers, more so than many other kind of conifers, uh, the branches die naturally and then so they turn into gin. And uh, it's that relationship between the deadwood and the live vein that really adds to the quality of, of junipers. All right, so here's the tree that I'm going to work on tonight. I got and uh, like I said, it's a procumbens juniper. Apparently, it was growing in an herb garden for some time. Yes, you have a question in the back. Yes, I have a question about the roots. Most of the bonsais that I see, they tend to be in really shallow pots. Shallow pots, exactly. And I mean, yeah. our nature or our understanding of trees is that there is actually a lot more roots under than what we see above. Is that the opposite with the bonsais? Uh, no. Well, sort of, but no. Um, okay, so I'll get to your question in a minute. Now, let me just do a, uh, a swirl around, and what I'm going to do tonight is start to do the major pruning on this to get it into a shape. So as I prune, I'll answer your question. Um, so when you look at a tree, the roots of a tree really are actually only working on the very tips of the roots. The rest of the roots are just like piping. So the actual the work where the, they're absorbing the water is just the tips. So as, when we repot a tree inside of this pot, we cut a lot of the, the roots back, and then new roots grow, and it's those tips that are doing all of the work. So you can have a tree that's this size in a very small pot, and as long as that pot is filled with root tips, rootlets, then the tree will be totally fine. 
Yeah, but in the the way that a tree grows in nature uh, is slightly different than the way that a tree grows in a pot. Dun dun dun! <laughs> and just like that, it's totally different. Okay, finished. Uh. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, of course. Uh, so, okay, so inside of this tree, this what this tree is doing is coming from the ground and then it's coming this way, the, the trunk, and then it has this massive twist that comes back here. So it, obviously you guys can't see it now, but the main trunk is doing this, and then from the top there's like three branches that come back here. What I just cut off was the longest tip of the longest branch. So no way on a tree this size that does that. We don't need it way over here, right? We're, we want it to do this instead of like that, right? <laughs> yeah. So. So the, the idea, uh, again, the goal here is we're going to have the, the head up here and the wind maker, the lowest branch is going to be like this, and then maybe we'll have a little branch here, but this basic shape, <laughs> yeah, however you want to call it, yeah. Uh, it's, the, it's a question of balance. For this, but the thickness of these, the thickness of the uh, the trunk of this tree, and like the proportion of things, I just feel like we'll make a better tree if that branch isn't on here. But uh, in in that in that way, if you have, if you could somehow manage to make like clones of the of a tree, and you have. 10 of the same exact tree, and you give them to 10 different bonsai professionals, right, they start starting with the tree that looks exactly the same, you'll get 10 different results. Because if we think about bonsai as the, the interaction between uh, the tree, the person that's making it, and the, the culture that that person's coming from, right, those three elements combined is what is going to influence how we're making this tree. So I have a different kind of cultural background than maybe another professional in Japan, and so perhaps the quality of my trees will be slightly different than the quality of his trees. Okay, so let's take a look at this piece right here. We have, from the bottom, we've got this big branch, but it's really only connected to two, just right here. So if I look at the whole entire tree, what I want to do with this tree there's really no need for this as much as there was no need for this. So we'll go ahead and cut this off too and see where that gets us. <laughs> yeah. So, oh boy. Cut, cut, cut. Uh, so this is a, uh, a branch cutter and I'm using it to cut branches. Um, I have, uh, I have with me, I have a, a branch cutter, a pair of scissors, uh, some pliers, and wire cutters. I don't expect to use the wire cutters or the pliers this evening. I might. I don't know. Um, but yeah, so there's that finished on this part anyway. I think what we could do, we could use these pliers and let's see if this works. When there's freshly cut branches and you want to turn them into gin, then we can use our pliers to kind of break up the skin and tear the, the bark off. I'm sorry, I have a question. Go ahead. Do you have a favorite plant to work with? Do I have a favorite plant? Like a favorite species? Correct. Uh, I, I like spruce. It's really fun to work with. It's the growing I'm sorry, who asked that? Can you raise your hand? Oh, in the back. I can look back there now. Uh, the way that spruce grow seems pretty, I, I understand it, as it were. 
um, I enjoy working with Spruce, but of course, as a professional in Japan, you kind of have to know how to deal with everything, right? But if I could choose, I would probably be working on uh, Spruce for maybe red pine. The quality of red pine is a very, it's very feminine, it's very flowing, right? It's similar to the here. So it, the juniper that we're working with tonight is uh, a procumbens, right? And the procumbens has naturally, like it deals with the uh, juvenile foliage, right? This short, pokey stuff, rather than like a, a, a mature area like this. So the quality of this looks maybe more like what you might think of a juniper, but the procumbens does this naturally juvenile uh, foliage across the tree most of the time. So it's quite challenging to try to get a procumbens not to have juvenile foliage. So you kind of just have to deal with the juvenile foliage and accept it for what it is. Right, so as I'm working, so now we've got this and we've got that. And now, probably those two big cuts were probably the biggest cuts that we need to make. But maybe, now if I, if I look in here, I have, I mean, let's look at our tree, right? It's just still a big green blob. Maybe it needs some definition in its pads, right? There should be some, some space in between there. If you remember some of those pictures that I showed you of the, the nicer trees now, you've got a foliage pad here, and then you have some space, and then you have another foliage pad, and another foliage pad. So it's really the space between the pads that causes the quality of the tree to come forward. Is there any spirituality in the whole trimming the tree like finding out what the tree would like or how, what direction it wants to go or any of that, or is that none, none of that? Uh, yes, there is. Sure. I mean, I don't know how, I don't know how, like, literal you would want to get with it, but um, my teacher once said to me at the beginning of my apprenticeship, I was watering a tree, practicing one night, and he, he looked at me and he said, Adam, it's not a painting. So, it's not a blank canvas, right? The tree has a, a quality and has a shape, and so you have to, it's more like a dance than anything else. And so I don't know that there's like religious or, or spiritual kind of that kind of feeling, but there is a relationship. I have to allow the tree to, to tell me what it wants me to do to it. And I have to listen to it. A uh, question here. So just on that note of religion and spirituality, so uh -huh. the name Jinn, yeah. um, it sounds familiar, I think, within more Muslim-oriented cultures around spirits that live in trees, okay. or evil spirits that live in trees. And does that have any relationship? Because they do call them Jinn as well, or al so Oh, I, 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 I doubt it. So no connections at all? Just uh, No, I don't imagine that there would be much uh, relationship between really any uh, Middle Eastern or, or Western religions and what's happening in Bonsai. You're ready to see what I just cut off? Dun, dun, dun. Right, so we need like space, right? Yeah, already. Yeah. So. It's the space in between that's gonna, going to allow us to, to, um, to differentiate what's going on in here. The reason that I chose to, to cut that branch off is I'm watching to see where the tr branches are coming out of the main trunk. So we have this theory in bonsai as like part of the, the how do you build a, a bonsai? How do you know which branch to cut? Because you could say, well, I don't really know which branch to cut so, and, and become paralyzed with that idea. But if you break it down, into a structure, a, a standard approach. And you, you say, I have one branch, and I want that one branch to fork into two. And then I want each of those branches to then fork into two. And it into two, one into two, one into two, one into two. And this is how we build ramification. So if I'm looking down in here, and I have a, a one particular junction that has six or seven branches coming out of it, then I know that that's way too many. That if you could actually see that, that junction, it's going to look like an octopus or something with so many coming out of it. So you would then need to choose. You might not necessarily want to cut all of them down just to having two left, 
but you would want to reduce that down to let's say I don't know four three or four at most um, so that's what I'm doing so let's see if we can do it this way yes yes exactly so I have got this brand the main trunk is coming here and then that main trunk sweeps back this way and my head is coming up here so if I feel in this area right here I've got a couple of different branches coming off so then the question okay this tree is going to come here and then come back this way so the head of this tree is going to be in this area question is do we or do we not need this right here so think about that that's question one question two if you look at this from the side right meaning the fronts here it's very wide, isn't it? Yeah. So we should probably cut some of this off in order to get this down to a reasonable spot. So the question then becomes, do we cut all of this off? And say, we actually don't need any of this. Or do we cut the front of the tree off and say, this is actually in the way, so we don't need this? Question. Maybe it's hard for you guys to see exactly what's going on, but by show of hands, who wants to cut this off? Okay, other way around. Who wants to cut this off? Oh, it's like 50 50. Oh, oh boy. <laughs> just, just <laughs> at the end of the, in, in, uh, in 20 minutes, I'm going to have like one branch left. <laughs> then, then what, what do we do then? So, okay, let's see. If we've got this main trunk and it's bending up to the top and that would look pretty, and this is all in this area. Ooh, that's a lot of, lot to cut off right there. Do we do it? Should we? Yes? One more time, who says cut it off? That's a lot to cut off. All right, we're going in baby steps. So this, did that do anything? A little bit? Very little. Let's get rid of this. Now maybe you guys can see a little bit better what's going on, right? In this area. So, so again, if the trunk is here and it's coming this way and then it's swooping back, now to your left. So this here, we don't need it, do we? So, so when I was studying, my uh, my teacher, he would he would give me these trees, and then he would say his instructions were. Adam, don't use any wire and don't cut too much. So I thought, for like five years, I thought, what in the world am I supposed to do with this tree if I'm not supposed to use any wire and I'm not supposed to cut too much? How am I supposed to do this? Maybe theoretically I figured it out eventually, but even today, whenever I go back and I spend time working with my teacher, he still says the same exact thing, Adam. Don't cut too much. Okay. What do you want me to do then? Make make it beautiful, but you don't want me to cut it. No. No, don't cut too much. Okay. Is, has this tree been worked on and shaped already, and how old is it? Uh, uh, no, it has never been worked on, right? No, this is this is uh, the first styling of the, styling, the first working of this tree, and um, it's what did you say, fifty years old, forty years old? So, by show of hands, who thinks 50-year-old trees are old? Sort of. Do, do any of you know what the oldest, uh, the oldest growing tree species is? I'll give you a hint. It lives in America. It's, it is a kind of pine. 
Starts with a B. Bris. Yes, the bristlecone pines are the oldest known like growing trees. Um, some are they say are like up to five or six, maybe eight thousand years old. So there's I think there's like some some aspen groves that are like quite older than that. But then technically speaking, that's not a single living tree. It's a a group of of self cloned like offspring. But individual single trees that are growing up to up to eight thousand years old. There's a, a an island in the south of Japan called Yakushima that's famous for its cedar trees that are also very very old. So fifty years is actually not so old. Is there a question in the yeah, back? There's a question. Um, when you said there are bonsai professionals in Japan, what's uh -huh. on the job description? What what do you do with that? <laughs> a job description. Of being a bonsai professional, well, uh, yeah, I, I tend to my garden. Um, yeah. <laughs> well, I mean, there are most of these. It's for-profit businesses, right? So what we're doing most of the time is uh, tending to our trees, growing trees for. For sale or for rent, and um, you know, different gardens have different approaches to, to what that means. But some amount of time is spent. It, it, it maybe the easiest way to break it down is uh, to discuss the the season. So in the springtime, we're repotting trees, and then in the, in the when spring turns into summer, we spend a lot of time uh, watering and pruning our deciduous trees. And then when summer turns into fall, or when spring turns into summer, we spend a lot of time watering because they're in little tiny pots and they dry out fast. Uh, and then in the fall and through the winter, then we can. This is when we can do our styling work of the trees. And so, you know, that usually means that at some point in time, on any given day, I'm outside all day, uh, watering the trees or styling the trees, pulling it into a, my workshop and doing this kind of work on it. Uh, occasionally I'm going to customers' houses to do the same thing. Occasionally I'm going to professional auctions to buy and sell trees. So as I'm, as I'm going, uh, one of the things that my right hand is doing right now is picking out the, like the, the little growth that's growing in the, in the crotches. As you can see, here, right? We have our two our two branches, and then this little growth in them that's coming right out of the middle. So I said before, ideally we want one into two, and then one into two. So now if we've got this little growth in the middle here, it's no longer one into two, is it? It's one into three. Yeah. Because we have one, two, three, right? So this little stuff is what we would want to pick out of the the crotches of our larger growth. Oh, yeah, sure, sure. Go ahead. When you get to the point where you're happy with this piece, would you keep it in this pot and would you keep it outside or inside? Uh, okay, let's break that question down. Most trees, in most situations, are going to be healthier and happier long-term outside. If you get into some of your tropicals, maybe you like your ficus, maybe you're like a chiflera, right? You could probably get away with keeping those inside. Um, but you're, you're, generally speaking, most trees are going to be happier outside most of the time. And then as far as this goes, this tree, yeah, We'll definitely repot it because it's in a big black plastic <laughs> nursery container, and that's <laughs> yeah, it's it's a great great uh, aesthetic relationship here, isn't it? Yeah, when when we repot, like I at at the beginning, that question about the root, how much root mass is there on the trees? So as we repot, this typically happens in the springtime. So after I do this work on this tree, 
uh, I would imagine that it, if it gets repotted, when it gets repotted, it will be next springtime. And then when we do that, especially here, to take something that's been growing in such a large nursery container, yeah, there'll be massive root reduction. And it's a lot of people ask, you know, the question like, how often do you, how often do you wire a tree? How often do you repot? And it's hard to give a general answer to that question because each tree, each tree is different. Generally, generically, we might say, well, we repot a tree every three to five years, and maybe you have the same timeline for putting wire on a tree and shaping it. Um, but then, inside of that, there will always be outliers, as it were. Okay, so one of the things that I'm doing now in this area is I'm I'm cleaning up like the bottom of this. So here. You can see this little piece here is growing down. Yeah. So before I said, oh, we want one into two, and then one into two. Yeah. If you've got one into five, how do you start to decide which ones you keep and which ones you cut? So there's three basic principles that you would want to keep in mind when you're deciding which ones to keep and which ones to cut. So I'll show you on this. So right here on this on this in this area right here we have one into one two three four five six right so there's six branches all coming out of this one spot obviously we don't want that what's going to happen is the energy is going to come the sugar is going to come back from the leaves through the the branch system and that where that junction is that's going to swell more than any other space because that's what like the intersection. So that'll swell, and then we'll, we'll, we'll get what's called reverse taper, where the trunk is, or the branch is thin, and then it bubbles up, and then it comes out. So it's not very pretty. We want a nice taper as we go from the trunk is this big, and then the primary branches are, you know, smaller than that, and then smaller than that. And as it slowly shrinks in thickness, the branch is down to the tips. So here we have six branches. Now let's, let's just say that we don't want this length because this whole thing is actually coming out of this. So we say, actually this length is all we want. We want the pad right here. We don't need this. So we'll take out the fat one first, right? So that also, I said, there's three elements, yeah? One is the, the varying strengths of the branches. So if you only want two left and one is really, really tiny and a baby and the other one is this big around, they're not even, they're not balanced. The strength balance is off. So the amount, the whatever branches we leave at the end, we'd want them to be close enough that they're basically 50-50 in terms of energy, right? Then the next idea would be if my branch is going to sit laterally like this, right? I would rather have the branches on the left and right than the branches on the top and bottom. I can keep the branches on the top and bottom if the energy is better, the energy balance is better between top and bottom. I can then use wire to twist it like this. But if my left and right branches are evenly balanced, then I might as well just leave, keep the left and right. That way I don't need to wire them left and right. They're already left and right. So if we look at this again, right, we say, this big one was on the top, and it was way too fat. So that's like a double whammy. We don't need that one, right? And then if you look at it from the top now, now we see this branch is growing like backwards, back into the tree. Well, that's not going to be useful later on. So let's get rid of that one second, right? And then we see we have these little babies, so we obviously don't need those. We already discussed. And now we're back at this point. We have three, three branches that are coming off of one space. And maybe we say, okay, three is better than six, so we can leave it at three. But if we wanted to, we might want to keep you no longer need. Now I'm going to say that the energy between the one on the left and the one in the middle is better than the energy balance between the one on the right and either of these two. If you guys can see, these two are similar thicknesses, and this one is a little thinner, right? 
So I'll go ahead and remove the thinnest of them. And then I can say, OK, with the remaining two, now I can use wire to properly place these where I want to get a nice, clean, energy, uh, energy balanced branch. Does that make sense? So that's, this is the thought process that I'm going through when I'm up here and I'm, my hands are in here and you can't see what I'm doing. I'm picking off the little stuff and then I'm looking at these, uh, these junctions and saying, okay, what do I have? Basically, kind of the general approach, more often than not, the stuff that's hanging off the bottom is really not going to be useful. It's, hanging, it's growing off the bottom. It's a little weaker. Some of the first branches that I cut off of this tree to allow you guys to see in here, they were branches that were growing down. and We just know that we're not going to use them pretty much ever. So then I have another one here. This example here, we have three branches coming off the same spot, and one is that, so it's totally useless. We can get rid of that and clean it up. Can you talk a little bit more about renting uh, bonsai? Oh, sure, sure. Um, well, if you have a uh, business, <laughs> and you're, yes, thank you. If you have a business and you have like customers coming, and maybe let's say for example you own a restaurant, and now typically you might see that you have on your table, on your get your your tables, you have a little glass vase with a cut flower in it, right? That's great. So why not switch out the glass vase with the cut flower in, instead of put a small bonsai on that table and now you have that beautiful thing to look at while you're eating dinner. Or if you have um, uh, like a, a company meeting and you have someone giving them a speech, company president perhaps, Maybe that company president next to him might want something to look at instead of him while he's talking. So then that, that's the kind of uh, bonsai rental that happens a lot in Japan. Okay, so if we look at just this one pad that I'm holding out for you, it's much, with, just, with no wire and just a little bit of pinching and cutting, now this is it's kind of an established pad that we have here. There might be a little bit of unnecessary length on the top, inside, but we can wait until later to, to fully figure that one out. This area down here, so I want the tree to come out this way, but this one branch right here is growing off the bottom again, so we'll cut that off as well. Yeah, well, it was a little branch. I wanted to make sure. I, because really, if you have a branch that's hanging down like this, you could put wire in it and bring it up, right? Uh, the thing, though, I will, today I'm going to just be cutting this, and hopefully it'll look nicer when I'm done. Um, but on Sunday, we'll con I'll continue to work on this tree, and then that's when I'll be putting the wire on and wiring it out and refining it to see that if we can bring this tree from start to finish over the course of two working sessions. I'm sorry, say it again. One o'clock. Uh, question here. So you said you studied fine arts. Uh -huh. um, how did that, or does that help you with this work? And also, do you think that um, bonsai artists or folks have sort of like signature styles? Like, can you identify somebody's work when you see it? Ah, uh, yes. Great question. Um, well, as, as we said, okay, so I said before, right, this, that bon making bonsai is this relationship between the tree, the individual, and the culture that's there existing. So a tree, individual, culture. That culture surely is the, the aesthetics of a culture. Yeah, so my, uh, my studying of fine arts allows me some deeper understanding of, of artistic ideas, you know, line, value, balance, these kind of aesthetics. So that helps a lot in me being able to look at trees and, and think about kind of the quality or stuff, the aesthetics of the tree. And now, just tonight I'm talking about, you know, how to make a tree. We have not even begun to think about how to display a tree, right? The, the art of displaying a tree is as complicated as you could imagine. 
Uh, and that really is that's the uh, another level of the aesthetics of bonsais and the, the display. So your second question of are there like signature styles uh, inside of people? Uh, yeah, I think if I showed you a, a, a selection of trees from, let's say, five seriously well-known and highly regarded artists, then you would be able to see the difference between them. And so me, as a professional in Japan, when I go to like uh, the national exhibition that happens every February, I can tell by the quality of the wire on the trees who worked on it. Because again, ev every individual is going to have a slightly different approach. And so the more you see them, the more you would know. But on the other, other side of that, it's all bonsai, right? So there's the, the difference between artist A and artist B. It's pretty subtle what the difference is. Sure. Yeah. Uh, yeah, I actually went to Alfred to study ceramics, um, but then shortly thereafter decided that I didn't really want to play with mud, and so decided that I should pursue the two-dimensional two art. Uh, printmaking really caught my, caught my eye. Um, but of course, when you're talking about the aesthetics of bonsai and the aesthetics of bonsai display, the container becomes very important. He's okay. He's fine. Is, is it a black widow? <laughs> so I have a question about prices, if you don't mind me asking. It's, oh, okay, it's sure. me yeah. again, the yeah. rude lady. Um, sorry. <laughs> so, I mean, this is also quite an interesting business from what I understand. And uh -huh. so, if you don't mind sharing, like, what are the prices that you're dealing with? Um, and also, maybe you can talk about, like, one of the most expensive bonsai tree, if you don't mind sharing that. Sure. Uh, I'll talk uh, generically about prices. So to start with, I work in Japan, right? So my experience with prices are Japanese prices rather than American prices. I don't know, I'm not, a, I'm not familiar enough with American, the American um, economy of bonsai to make a comment about that. But inside of Japan, I don't know. I, 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 I really don't know. The, I can tell you that the, the, the history and quality of Japanese bonsai and the history and quality of the Japanese bonsai industry is very, very, how can I say, chaptered, right? It, there's, a, it, there's a lot, I'll, it's been doing it for a long time, so it's, it's pretty thoroughly organized. Where I could say that in, in America, maybe the history of the industry is rather young still. So I don't know that in America you would have... Um, a, as much of an appreciation for the, the pots as you would in Japan. So like to maybe some of your other questions about like high, super high end stuff. Well, we could say that it is not uncommon at the highest level of display at the national exhibition in Japan in Tokyo every, every February that you would see a tree that is $250,000 in a pot that's $500,000 on a stand that's $100,000. I don't have any of that at my garden. <laughs> but if you, have, if you have a rich uncle, uh, later on I can give you my phone number. Okay, so again, we're seeing this like really clean line develop here, right? And we're seeing this really clean line start to develop on some of these paths. And then if you look at this front area here, not so clean, yeah? You have a lot of that, un that stuff growing underneath. So what I'm gonna do, what I'm working on now is to just go around, because I've, after we took off these big chunks of things, well, what's left over, we m probably will use, but it's going to be a little bit more uh, so subtle and sophisticated and nuanced to decide, well, do we actually need this or that? 
But before we can get to that step, we'll go. I'll, I'll go and, and just finish taking the stuff again. When you really, if you were able to put your hand inside of this tree and feel this branch, you would see that that the stuff that's that appears to be growing on the bottom is in fact growing on the bottom, and therefore will be the easiest stuff to cut off to clean up the the edges. Go ahead. Yeah, that's a, a great question, a really, really great question. Because, um, you know, that very first thing I did was just like cut off the, the, the long thing. And, well, why, why not keep it? Yeah. So my, my approach, my feeling, would be that the, the quality and the size of this tree is going to be, to a large extent, limited by the, the quality of the trunk. So I, part of this little, so, excuse me, slideshow that I gave you was like a, an image of a whole bunch of different shapes. So inside of those different shapes, some trees and some trunk lines lend themselves well to certain shapes. So for example, if I have a very, uh, you could have a very thin but very tall tree, right? That, that might be three feet tall, but also very, very thin. So it's okay for that to be tall because that, that particular shape is the aesthetic, quality of being tall and thin. But on this tree, because I know that the thickness of this trunk is so thick and the image that I have in it is of a certain compactness, so then I know that I, in fact, I don't need this long edge here. Uh, to that end, you might say, well, could you take a tree like this and, and or maybe a little baby seedling and then stick it in the ground in your backyard and grow yourself a big tree. Yes, you could, but it would take you the rest of your life. So theoretically, if you want a big tree, start with a big tree and, and work on it. And if you want a small tree, then start with a small tree and work on that. Inside of bonsai, there are a handful of, of kind of established size frames. Um, one would be shohin, right? And that's what in English, that's what we use, we use the Japanese word for it, which it just means small thing. So this is um, basically stuff that if you had it in a pot, you could put it in your hand, right? That's maybe the height of your hand this way, right? And then you have the middle size, chuhin. So if you could take one shohin and, and hold it in one hand, then chuhin, you'd have to use two hands to hold it. And then ogata is the big stuff. And that you'd need two people, one on each side to carry. Uh, this tree, the size and quality of this, this was gonna, this will make a very beautiful chuhin, right? The middle-sized tree when we're all said and done. All right, so let's see. What about this branch right here? Do you think we need this branch? No. But I like this branch. No, we like. Okay. <laughs> Good question, would wire help? If you look at this branch compared to the rest, the tip of, the, I mean, it's coming off the same kind of mother branch, we'll call it. So here we have the first branch, the top branch is here, and then what I'm asking you about is sort of underneath. So no matter what kind of wire magic we might be able to accomplish, it's going to be very hard to pull this like that, right? Horticulturally speaking, you're if you have a branch that's being shaded out, it's gonna die. So the way that we're choosing to cut things off, one of the factors that we're thinking about is, is it uh, sustainable, right? Is that branch going to actually be able to live into the future? Well, if it's, being, if it's underneath another branch, then no. Maybe it'll live for some amount of time, a year, I don't know, but eventually it's going to die. So in fact, if you come in here and you look at some of this like interior growth, it's really small and twiggy and super tiny because it's been shaded out. It's a dead already, this little stuff in the middle. And that's why. So that, the stuff that's growing down usually is weaker. It's kind of like, um, and you, you could think of it as the, uh, the 
the insurance plan of the tree. If something bad happens here, well then this branch that's kind of just hanging out uh, could take over if something bad happens to the top. Um, I had a question about the buying and keeping of bonsai. Sure. So, for example, if I was a rich person who wanted to buy a bonsai, but I had no idea how to take care of it, mm -hmm. how would it be possible for me to keep bonsai? Like, what do people do? Do they hire people to like trim yeah. it or repot it every you year? You got it. Uh, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> the uh, a, a good portion of of any bonsai professional's business is going to be to take care of trees for their customers. Whether or not that customer owns a tree at their house, or if the, if the tree is being stored at the garden, either way, many people, you, maybe a good analogy would be like racehorses, right? If you are, have like a racehorse that you, is going to go win the Kentucky Derby, if you can afford to own that racehorse, you probably have something else that you're spending your daytime doing, right? That gives you that money. It means you probably don't have either the time or the knowledge to want to take care of such a, a prized possession. So then, leave it to the professionals. We'll take care of it for you for a, for a small fee. And, and uh, inter I, again, I can only speak to what is happening in Japan, but I can tell you, like, again, this, this um, top quality, this high, super high level uh, bonsai exhibition, it's called the Kokofu, in February in, in Tokyo, a, a, the owners of those trees cannot put the tree into the show themselves. They have to request that a professional that's part of the Japanese Bonsai Association put the tree in for them. And so we as the professionals, we're the ones that are taking care of the paperwork and we're the ones that are, are carrying these things and preparing them and loading them into cars and setting them up on display. And then the owners, they have their names on a plaque in front, right? So then during the show, they can come by and get their picture taken and, and say, look at this awesome thing that I own, even though they're not, they have nothing to do with it, right? How um, often do you have to, like you work on this tree today and on Sunday, uh -huh. when would you come back to work on it again? Um, okay, so we, we can see that I'm going to, I'm cutting off half of this tree, right? And we're going into the dormancy of this tree. So after we do this work this time, today and on Sunday, then we'll just let this tree relax and then in, in the summertime, or not this, in the springtime, then we can come back and we can repot it. And then after that, it just, once it's like set, the bonsai is set, the shape is set and you're doing kind of maintenance, maybe is what you're really asking. The maintenance on, on trees, again, is seasonal. so. If, I, if this tree needs to be worked on again, it probably won't need to be worked on again for another year, surely another year. Let, the, let it grow out and then come back and re-prune and trim. And then, so it's like a cyclical time in that sense. So if we repot in the springtime, it's a conifer, so it probably won't be needed to be repotted for three or five years. So once we repot it next time, then it'll be a few years down the road before we need to repot the second time. And then that kind of cycle goes forward. Could you talk about water and uh, and the winter time as well? And I have a completely screwball question. Does anyone do any grafting? Uh, yeah, grafting is a, a, a huge part of it because if you have uh, if you have like a trunk that's really nice, but the branches are so far out that it can't be made nice, made good, then you could graft on new stuff here. Or if you have a uh, an important tree and maybe the top dies for whatever reason, then you could graft on new things. So grafting is very, very common. It's an essential skill set that any uh, quality bonsai practitioner should know. What do you think, you guys? Do we need it? No, no, no. Good, good. You're learning. Awesome. Uh, as far as like grafting? Yeah, yeah, yeah. It, basically, you can graft anything. And so... Um, the techniques that we're using, like grafting and whatnot, it, it, it's not something that you would do just to be like, yeah, I grafted this tree. But if the tree calls for it, if it seems necessary for the tree, then it would be something that you would pursue in that way. Uh, yeah, grafting is going to be done in the springtime. Yeah. Uh, he had a water question as well. Oh, okay, yeah, we went back to watering. Sure, go ahead. 
No, his question before. But you can, you can ask yours and I'll answer them at the same time. Okay, I, I wanted remember. to ask about um, how learning, did you learn Japanese before going to Japan to learn this? And did that hinder your, or help your understanding of bonsai? Or was that a an issue for you, understanding certain techniques or concepts like ogata and chukuku? And uh, yeah, good question. Uh, I, I spoke no Japanese when I moved to Japan. I could say, I think, like, you know, thanks to Queen, I could say, Domo Arigato. Um, but that's it. And then, so, okay, let's talk about those two things at, at the same time. Watering. Watering is a tricky thing because every plant is different, right? Even if you have two of the same species right next to each other, maybe the quality of the DNA makes them slightly different. Or the quality of the way that they're growing or the way that they've been trimmed. Or maybe one is a little sick and maybe maybe not. So watering, watering, uh, they say that you learn how to water for five years as an apprentice, and then you keep learning how to water until you die. So it's like it's 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 hard. It's the hardest part of bonsai. Generic the the with well, a safe bet, like generally speaking, you want to want to water your trees every day, once a day. That'll keep them alive, right? But if you want to take it up a notch, get a little better at it, then you're gonna start to decide. Does this tree need water now, or if you know peak performance, how often do I water it? And it, there's uh, every variable that you could imagine is in, is part of that question. Is it been fertilized? What season is it? Et cetera, et cetera. So then going back, okay, two questions. Do you think we need this? One question. Do you think we need this? Yes. Oh. It says no. Don't cut it. A lot, of, a, lot of, a lot of stuff here, isn't there? Okay, let's do this one little piece at a time. All right, let's cut that off. Let's cut that off. Like this, clean that up. Cut this off. Do you think we need it? This piece right here. It's growing to the side. I, I could cut off, like, I could pinch off the bottom parts of it. I could leave it there. Okay, so if I don't have it, it's like this. You can see more of the trunk, yes. If I have it, it's like this. So one of the things that we're that I'm asking about is just kind of like the size of the pad. So if on this tree that don't don't look at the top, it's not finished yet, but the, the rest of these pads, if we have one that's this big and then next to it you have a pad that's this big, they're not balanced, right? So maybe in that sense, we'll say that the rest of this pad is about this size. This will be over here. Might end up that we don't need that either. I'll go ahead and cut this off. Where? Of the trunk right here? Of the pad. So you're saying keep it. All right, well, well, we'll keep it for now. How's that? So the thing with cutting stuff off, right, is like you can always cut it off later. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I am unfortunately not a magician where you like rip up paper and then pour milk on it and then have the paper be back. I can't do that. Um, so okay, so the question about learning Japanese and talking about that. When I first started my apprenticeship, I could say as again, tomo uh, regato, and that's it. And so instead of using my ears, I used my eyes. And in a situation, for example, like repotting a tree, there's only so much going on inside of repotting a tree, right? It's like if the, if the guy is clearly in need of more soil, then I'm not going to bring him like a, a, a pair of scissors. I'm going to bring him more soil, yeah? my, my teacher. So for, for a while at the beginning, maybe the first two years of my apprenticeship, I spoke no Japanese and was it was it's hard. It's hard. Uh, it's very, very, very hard. But eventually, I proved that I actually wanted to do it and I proved that I was maybe capable. And so then I was able to say to my, my teacher, can I have time to go study Japanese? And so for six months, 
Monday through Friday mornings, I would go to a Japanese language school for three hours, and then I'd go to the garden in the afternoon. So I did that for six months, and that really helped. That I that got my my Japanese level to a point where I could more well. Even now, man, Japanese is hard. But uh, <laughs> it got me to a point that I I could use my ears from time to time. And then back to the watering, right? They say another thing about watering is if your senior, if anyone's higher than you, socially speaking, if your senior is watching you water, you're doing it wrong. You're gonna get yelled at. No matter what, and which is totally true. You're going to get yelled at. Okay, so we're getting somewhere on this. What do you guys think about this part right here? So if you look, let's look back at like our balance issues, right? We have this really nice, strong growth to the, on top, and then this little bit that's actually growing off the bottom of the main branch is weaker and in many ways is not necessary for that area. So we'll cut this off too. Uh, I always water by hand with a, a, a hose and you know some kind of like misting nozzle. So it's not like a like mist like at the mall when it's hot outside and they have like the misters or whatever. It's not not like that. Um, but they're not, like the black like an automatic lines that would have like the drip feeds. Yep. I think it, we go back to that question about if you're trying to keep it alive, that's like step one. But to really pursue this at the highest level, you need to get more more sophisticated than that. And so with those drip lines, I can't you can't control what's going on. So basically, it means at least an hour a day. I have to be outside watering the trees, looking at the trees. Right now, my wife is doing that, so I trust her. She's she, I, she she's learned. She's good. I have no fear. Hi. Um. Actually, two questions. Hello. Sure. Hi. Hi. Thanks for doing this. It's very interesting. <laughs> um. First question is: I just recently learned of this concept of um, like wabi sabi. Um, and it means the beauty of imperfection. Um, I'm still kind of trying to unpack what exactly that concept means. So could you talk about that concept in relation to bonsai? And then um, second question dovetailing that is, how do you make um, design choices about where you're displaying the bonsai in, in your gardens, both inside and outside? Um, kind of what's the bigger aesthetic decision in terms of display? Wabi sabi. Uh, we have 12 minutes, so uh, Wabi Sabi. <laughs> uh, okay, let, I'll, I'll go back to Wabi Sabi. The other questions, right? Displaying stuff, well, in some ways, okay, so if you have a bench and then you have some, these trees, they have, they have a flow to them, right? This one is going to go that way, yeah? If this is the front, then the flow of this, the Nagare, right? The wind is going this way. So then we'd say, if we're looking at it, when I'm looking at it, my eye is going to move this way. So then if I have a table, then my end bonsai should be, their wind, their movement should go into the table, right? That way it's like finished. So if you go to like a bonsai display, like an exhibition, chances are as you walk through those, those tables, the two end pieces are going to be powerful pieces that push the eye of the viewer into the, the rest of the table. And then across the table, you might want some variation in height. You might want some variation in quality of the trees, right? So you'd put like a, a deciduous next to a conifer next to a deciduous. And then you probably wouldn't have two. If you have two deciduous next to each other, they won't be of the same species. That's how maybe on a kind of meta scale, you would just think about uh, the aesthetics of uh, display. Wabi sabi. So, uh, wabi sabi. Yes, technically speaking, in, in, on one level, we could say that wabi sabi is the the beauty of the imperfect, finding perfection inside of the, the imperfect. Uh, on another level, we're going to say that wabi wabi is the the thought of the inside. Sabi is the outside. So wabi sabi is the effect, the the 
understanding the contemplation, the internal contemplation of the external effect on oneself, right? So you've got your old building, and it's gray because it has weather. So then you're looking at it, and what you're seeing there is you're seeing the effect of time, the residue of time on that building, right? The external impacting and affecting the internal, and then your contemplation of that. So inside of inside of bonsai, wabi sabi is not something that maybe is really going to get a lot of play versus uh, something called mochikomi, right? So that would be just like the the, the holding of time, right? Does something have a, a visual presence? So so in this tree, what we can see here, the mochikomi, right? The quality, the the texture of this bark. Right, is going to give us some understanding, some, some impression of age. If we had old gin, the quality, the texture of that gin is going to give us some understanding of the age. If we talk about pots, the patina on a pot is going to give us some indication of the age and the quality of those, those things. And if, you're, if you ever have a chance to uh, hold in your hand high quality ceramics, they have a texture and a somethingness to them that is tangible if you can hold it. And if you have like a $5 pot and a $500,000 pot, and you can hold the two of them, there will be no question which one is the higher quality pot. Okay, so so far, we're, we're okay until the top of this tree, right? Then we get to the top of this tree, and it's like, it's like this huge chunk of something right here. So we have to figure out what to do with that. What to do with that? We've got to break it up somehow, right? So naturally, we're going to say we're going to break it up by deciding where the lines of the branches naturally break it up. So we could, if we bend this down, then that's going to cause a line to be here. If we bend this down, then that's going to cause a line in this section here. And as we go through this tree, so this is going to be here, and this is going to be there. You might decide that this actually is unnecessary. Maybe it's too big, this pad, or maybe we might decide that these are unnecessary. Maybe these are too big. What do you guys think about that? Let's start there. Do you want to cut those off? To get rid of the top? Oh, over here? No, that one. OK. Here. So if we cut that off, then we have this area here. We have a big hole here. It's a, it, take, if, we, if we take this off, then we have this big space here, and then that big space just becomes bigger, yeah. which is a little risky. This one? No, but I would like... This, if this pad is going to be basically in this section here, and then if we cut the top off and this pad is basically next to it, well, if we could get some vertical height difference from one pad to the next, rather than all being like this, then that would be better, right? So we want to have like almost like a staircase up, this, up the tree. So in theory, maybe it would be best if we cut this bottom stuff off instead. <laughs> yeah, normally. It's a tree. It's just you and the tree, right? Yeah, it is me and the tree. And uh, a lot of the times, uh, for my own trees at my own garden, I really like to sit with the tree for, not like, not physically, literally sit with the tree, but I like to own a tree and have it in my garden for, for a, a good amount of time before I would go and make these decisions. you got to see what the tree is all about. You, know, you have to get a, a sense for the, the quality, the feeling of the tree. And it, it's fine to say, well, it's like I could make these aesthetic choices quite quickly. Like I can look at a tree that's, that, that's like a finished bonsai and I can, you know, dissect and diagram what's going on and what's good, what's bad, where are the flaws, where are the good, the charming points. Um, but if I'm going to take the time to work on a tree, then I would like to really be comfortable with the tree and, and so that I can get the best results possible out of it. 
But of course, uh, that's not to say like doing it like this is a problem or, or a bad idea or anything like that, but different different uh, circumstances. Yeah. Um, right. About the ownership of the tree, I was curious since you said it's like repotted every few years and after you're done today, it probably will be a long time before you work on it again. Uh -huh. Does like one person generally work on one tree or it's just like a trees are kind of in a group and anyone, like whenever it's ready, they'll work on it. I'm just curious since it's supposed to be like one person's art or is it like shared? Uh, trees are... Trees are passed from you know generation to generation and from owner to owner. Uh, so case by case, I guess. But it's it's very common to have trees that are, are hundreds of years old that have been passed on from one owner to the next. And in some ways, if you think that this is owning a bonsai is like owning a racehorse or owning a sports car or something, you might get you might become bored with the tree that you have, and you might want something new, so you want to get rid of it and buy a new one. Right? Um, I'm guessing my question is more of like in your personal experience, like say this tree. In a few years, do you think like you'll still be the one working on this tree, or will it be someone else's tree? It depends on if I get invited back. <laughs> as a as a as a traveling artist, you can uh, I should assume that. I have opportunities to lay my hands on trees and impact those trees, have an effect on those trees for what they are in this moment. And um, and as time goes on, the other professionals will put in their voice, and then the next professional will put in their voice. And this mochikomi that we were talking about, this, this quality that builds in the tree, will build in the tree from the different people that have worked on it. So again, even in Japan, where you have trees that are hundreds of years old, they hold the quality of the workers who have worked on them. Anonymously, perhaps, but still, you can see in the, the current state of a tree the past choices that, of the workers that have worked on them. So currently, the artists are still anonymous, so for a tree that's worked on by multiple people, no one like records the names of those people or anything? In not unless the they're un, un, unless you have like now this might be changing in Facebook and social media and worldwide uh, knowledge of what's going on and maybe nowadays maybe you might have like the the pedigree of a tree right that you could say here are the papers and it was picked by it was it was uh, taken from the mountain by this guy and then it was first styling was this guy and then the next and the next and it it builds the quality of the, the pedigree of the lineage of the tree in that way but. I think, in some sense, this is a, a kind of a newer situation. So when I'm working in the bottom or in, inside of the top here, I'm following that same basic approach, right? Finding my threes, taking them down, taking off the bottoms, taking off the little stuff, and that's if I start with that, then I don't have to make, you know, these big decisions. Do I want to take out this whole branch to start with? Let's not. Let's let's save that. Let's clean it out. Let's clean out the stuff we 100% know we don't need. And then with whatever we might need, then we can make those choices between A and B, or B and C. But to start off with, the easiest stuff to cut off is the stuff you absolutely know you don't need, right? So on the question of what you're talking about, I have one last question, I'm sorry. Um, have you ever cut with regret? or cut <laughs> and realize because that's really my biggest fear you know like i would take forever to cut a tree and this bonsai tree would get like old with me uh yeah there's uh, yes uh, surely i have i have cut things off and then thought later on oh i shouldn't have done that but i've also recognized over the the years that it's better to not have that hesitation and to if you're following sound theory and sound principles of why you know starting with the ones on the bottom start and the ones that are on the top and figuring out the balance then kind of through serendipity these things in some ways make the choices for you if you're comfortable with how you make the choices and then you learn that even uh, in the best of times you're going to be wiring something 
and it's going to snap. And you think, oh, I really liked that branch. That was like the point of this tree, and it just broke. I didn't mean to break it, but it broke. So what do I do? And the best thing you can do is just pretend it never, it was never there, right? And just say, because you're not putting it back on. So pretend it was never there and then move forward. And see what, what, uh, what, now that that branch is missing, what opportunities does that provide me that I wouldn't have seen were that branch there? Yeah, sure, 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 sure. Yeah, because it kind of shows partially like your current state of mind and this whole spiritual flow between the human and the tree. And you might have one intention and you might have cut something the wrong way, but then it seems like that there is actually a comeback, at least the way it sounds from you. You're, you're always able to move on to the next state Sure. So I guess it changes with you as well, I would say, or is this like kind of like, oh, you regret it and you always regret it, or you're like, okay, you move on, and it's like, you next tree, you have to move on. Thank yeah. you. Sure. Thank you. And I, I think to that end, right, when I, when I get, oh, we're at the eight, but uh, I'll just tell you one last story because it's on that point. When I was first learning how to wire stuff, my teacher gave me very young baby trees and said, break them, kill them. Oh. Because if you don't know, and I said, really? And this is his answer. If you don't know where the line between life and death is, you can't do this job. You have to break a tree to learn where that line is. And the closer you can flip with that line, the better trees you'll be able to make. So, so OK, this is what we've got so far, rather different than what we had before. And on Sunday, we'll go in and clean it up.